Dear brothers and sisters, we've all heard the hadith about the man who killed 99 people and then he goes and he asks for repentance, for forgiveness and he sees that the person that he's asking forgiveness or he's asking if he has a chance at the forgiveness and mercy of Allah tells him that how do you expect to meet your Lord having killed 99 people and because he answers him that way he kills this man too, kills a hundred people, goes to a scholar, the scholar tells him who can stand between you and the mercy of Allah but you need to change your life, you need to go to this land, resettle and start over with your Lord. And of course as we know he dies along the way and the angels are perplexed with whether this man is to be punished or to be shown mercy and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says measure the distance between his body and the land that he left and the land that he was going to and treat him in accordance with the land that he is closest to and Allah in one narration even causes the land to shift him closer to the land that he was going to so that he could show him his mercy. It is a wonderful narration about the powerful mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but Imagine being one of those 100 people roaming in paradise and as you are roaming the beautiful gardens of paradise, you look up and you see the man who murdered you. Imagine the thoughts and the way that that person would feel like, whoa, this person is in Jannah. Imagine being Hamza, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Sayyid al-Shuhada, the leader of the martyrs, the leader of the Shuhada, and the last thing he saw in this world was Wahshi, who threw the spear into his chest and Hamza pursued him عنه, until he collapsed because he no longer had any breath to go after the one who threw that spear. And then after his death would cut him up at the order of Hind and serve his liver to her so that she could chew it. Imagine Hamza عنه, meeting Wahshi in Jannah. Imagine all of those shuhada of Uhud in fact, seeing Khalid ibn al-Walid and Ikrama and Amr ibn al-As, these people that lived to become great companions and seeing them roaming in Jannah and saying, SubhanAllah, they made it? Because as far as they are concerned, they don't read the sword of Allah and they don't read the glorious story of Ikrama's jihada and they don't read the story of Amr ibn As and Islam spreading throughout the world to places like Egypt. The last thing they saw in this world was them killing them. And this is the beautiful hadith that I wanted us to draw a few lessons from in the short time that we have. This is a hadith that's narrated in Bukhari and Muslim and narrated in fact through many different books of hadith. It is an agreed upon hadith from Abu Hurairah ta'ala anhu that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Yadhaqullahu ila rajulain. Allah laughs at two men this interesting, peculiar meeting that takes place. Allah laughs at these two men. One of them kills the other. And then they both enter into Jannah. And the Sahaba said, how is that, Ya Rasulullah? How is that even possible that a murdered man meets his murderer in Jannah? And the Prophet wasallam said that this man strives in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and is killed by the other. So Allah enters him into paradise and then the one who murdered him repents to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, turns back to him and is turned to in mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and dies a similar way and then they meet one another in Jannah. SubhanAllah, Allah laughs at this meeting, this awkward meeting of two people in Jannah. Imagine meeting your murderer in Jannah. Now of course at that point it's not let's continue the battle because we enter into Jannah grudge-free. Any ill feelings are removed from our hearts. We are purified before we enter into Jannah. Ikhwanan ala sururin mutaqabideen. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us amongst them brothers and sisters sitting on thrones facing one another. The only thing that we have are memories of joy. And the only thing that happens in Jannah is an increase in joy and happiness. So there's no sadness there. There's no, Ya Allah, can you get this one out? It is SubhanAllah, Alhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar, what is this? But it's happiness and it's joy. And I wanted to talk about this inshaAllah ta'ala, just five quick lessons from this beautiful hadith, which shows us so many different layers of our deen. Number one, 
Think about it from the perspective of the one who carried out such a grievous action. How do you even move on from committing a major sin? And we know that shaitan will go to the one who committed a major sin and tell him, you think Allah is going to accept you? Don't even think about repenting. How are you going to turn back to Allah? In the case of these people, you killed Sahaba. You murdered people close to the Prophet ﷺ. You persecuted the Prophet ﷺ. What makes you think Allah would forgive you? But just like the man told the man from Bani Israel who killed a hundred people, who is the obstacle between you and Allah's mercy? Who gets to stand between you and Allah's mercy? You have a path back to Allah. So long as you are still breathing in this life, you have a chance to enter into paradise. The door of repentance is open for you no matter what major sin you have committed. It is still open for you. And so that's something that we take from this. But then that person on the other side might think, but what about you know, justice? And what about la ظلم اليوم, the day of judgment? There's no injustice today. And will I not get my right? Don't we have the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ about al-muflis, the bankrupt person who shows up at the scale with their prayers, with their fasting, with their charity, but they're backbiting and they're gossiping and they're harming people and their honor or their property or dharabahadha, hitting someone. All of that takes away their good deeds. Don't we have that hadith? Yes, we do. And Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he said that in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah, if He chooses to forgive and show mercy upon you, and enters you into his favor by that repentance, he will allow all of the rights to be paid back to that person and Allah would take your good deed and increase it until it covers all of those rights that have been taken out of Allah's love and mercy for you. That way that person is not wrong, they have their full rights, nor are you excluded from Allah's mercy and forgiveness. This speaks to a person who repents, who turns back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The gravity of the sin dissolves in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It does not matter how grave the sin is, it's about the sincerity of repentance. And that means that if you are alive and you have harmed someone, seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This does not say, well, I'll just wait for that person to die and then I'll make tawbah and then maybe Allah will forgive me. No, the Prophet ﷺ said, do not sleep. Don't leave this world with zulm on your scale, with oppression on your scale. Go and seek forgiveness, go and undo, go and reconcile. لا يدخل الجنة النمام Don't be a person who dies a slanderer and does not seek forgiveness for that, does not undo the harm. Go and seek forgiveness, seek the proper recourse. But as you seek the proper recourse, know that you have a Lord that accepts repentance if it's sincere, no matter how great. So that's number one. Number two, the vastness of Allah's mercy in this hadith. That Allah's mercy encompasses both that person and that person. That Allah's mercy cannot be limited by anyone or by any circumstance. And that every single person has a path back to Allah's mercy. And Alhamdulillah, Allah did not put us at the mercy of other people. But we are at His mercy ultimately subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number three, the vastness of Allah's paradise, Allah's Jannah. You know, it's not like there's not enough space here. That one person has to go and the other person can't go because you're there. How many times do you want to go to a party but you say, if that person is going to be there, I'm not going to be there. Let me know who else is invited because I don't want to go if that person's there. I don't want to go to this invitation, any social gathering. But I didn't want to go because that person's there. Keep it small and everything is exclusive. This is Allah's Jannah, Allah's paradise. And Allah, should Allah choose to forgive you and forgive the one you dislike? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not be limited in His Jannah and there is space in Jannah for everyone who qualifies. That's number three. Number four, that every hardship in the form of a person or a thing that is sent to us in this life is an opportunity to elevate ourselves in the next life. Asa an takrahu shay wa huwa khayrun nakum. You might hate something and it's better for you. You might hate something and it's better for you. No one seeks to be harmed. You should not put yourself in harm's way. No one likes to be harmed. But every person or thing or circumstance that Allah has put in your way in this life is a means of elevating yourself in the next life if you respond in the appropriate way. Allah has a path that He crafts for each one of us. Our paths are customized to paradise. 
And so it may be that that person lived long enough and made repentance and tawbah to Allah and they had their path to paradise. But subhanAllah, that person was the reason for you entering into paradise. The difficulty that came to you through that person was the means by which you entered into paradise. Everything or person, hardship that comes in your life is a means of elevating yourself in the next bidnillah ta'ala. And lastly, a mindset. Your success does not depend upon the failure of others. So many of the dunyawi diseases, the worldly diseases that we have are based out of this faulty idea that our success depends upon the failure of others. And so we try to hurt others to get above, whether that is in regards to our worldly affairs or in regards to our affairs of the hereafter. And one of the lessons that we take from this hadith is that our success does not depend on the failure of others. We should never try to bring someone else down in order to bring ourselves up. We should never hurt to elevate because there is no true elevation in that sense. And subhanAllah, the way Allah Azza wa says about those that said, even about the Prophet Sallallahu receiving revelation, that it should have descended upon, why not upon one of us instead? Why not one of the great men? Why not one of us? Why didn't I become a Prophet? And in the process of that, they missed out on becoming Sahaba and having the companionship of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Jannah by following him and obeying him and by doing good because they were so bent on, why him and not me? Your success does not depend upon the failure of others. Allah's rahmah in this life and in the next is vast enough to encompass us all, so long as we stay focused on attaining His rahmah, His mercy, and attaining His paradise. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow everything that happens to us to direct us to His mercy and to His paradise. Everything that comes our way to be either a means of expiation or a means of elevation. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the best of this life and the best of the hereafter.